Hi there. I'm Tim Pratt, author of The Fractured Void, the first novel set in the world of the legendary strategy game Twilight Imperium. This is a space opera novel about a group of courageous weirdos who are trying to protect a brilliant scientist named Philip Thales, who has the capacity to create technology that will alter the balance of power in the entire galaxy. Problem is, Thales is an absolutely terrible person. Nevertheless, a lot of other people want to get their hands on him too because of what's inside his head. I'm going to read just a little bit, just a chunk of the first chapter to whet your appetite. Felix waited in the darkness on the lower deck of the Timerarius. The only illumination came from faint guide lights running along the floor, pulsing in the direction of designated exits. Carefully, silently, he began to move, confident that he wasn't being watched, at least for the moment. He crept along a corridor and moved past unoccupied crew cabins, converted to storage for emergency relief supplies. He moved slowly, looking into each crowded room for a moment before moving on, listening for the faintest whisper of sound and feeling for minute disturbances in the air. Felix was hunting. He considered taunting his prey, trying to provoke, provoke an error he could exploit, but it was a risky move and better tried when he was in a more defensible position. He paused at the end of the corridor with open doors on his left and his right. In a more demanding posting, the cabins on either side would provide housing for two crew members. Instead, the cabin on the left held pallets of potable water, while the one on the right, for some reason, held crate after crate of signal flares. The mysteries of military procurement were doubtless baffling in all societies, but in the Mintak coalition, they were even stranger. The various supplies the raider fleet's pillage had to end up somewhere, and an overstocked quartermaster had taken the opportunity to cram the Timerarius with its whole deck of unused space, full of odds and ends of no great use to anyone. Felix ducked into a side room and crouched behind a pallet of shrink-wrapped air purifiers, listening hard, but the only sound was his own breath. He jostled the pallet and gasped, short and swiftly cut off as if, if he'd injured himself and made an involuntary sound. He immediately silently moved to the far side of the room, waiting to see if his bait would be taken. There was no movement, no sound, nothing. He might have been alone down here in the dark, but he knew better. Felix crept back out into the corridor, carefully scanning for the most minute shift in the shadows. Nothing. His quarry was elsewhere. He considered the T-intersection before him. If he went left, he'd reach the deserted galley, and if he went right, he'd reach a workout room full of unused training machinery. There were more hiding places in the galley, but something clattered in the cabin on his left. It sounded like a water bottle, jostled by mistake, bouncing off the frame of a bunk and skittering across the floor. Felix immediately spun and faced right instead. There was no way his subtle and deadly prey would make a sound like that by accident. The little monster was trying to distract him, which meant the ambush would be coming from the other side. In fact, the attack came from above. A weight crashed down on Felix's neck and shoulders, driving him to his knees, and a slick, smooth limb he couldn't see sneaked around his throat. Felix was bigger and heavier than his opponent, though, and he threw his weight back, hoping to crush the attacker between his own body and the wall, or failing that, at least dislodge her. Instead, she slithered around his body, shifting from his back to his front so all he did was rattle his own spine on imp impact. Die, scum! A voice hissed, hot breath on his face, but there was no face there, just a sort of shimmer that made his eyes water if he focused too hard, and strong, thin fingers wrapped around his throat. The overhead lights came on brightly, and the voice of the ship's security officer, Calred, purred laconically from hidden speakers all over the deck. Captain, if you and Tib are finished playing hide-and-seek, we have an urgent message from one of the colonies. The shimmer stopped shimmering and resolved into the round, green face of Captain Felix Duval's first officer, Tib Pelta, her yellow, lamp-like eyes shining as she smiled, showing all her teeth. The rest of her body, dressed in the uniform of the Mintak Coalition Navy, came into focus a moment later. The Israel ability to hide from sight, fading, wasn't technically invisibility, but functionally there wasn't a big difference. As an infiltration specialist, her uniforms and spacesuits were woven with rare fabrics that could bend light, 
and augmented with devices that stymied detection of heat signatures and other life signs. Tib let go over Captain's throat, straightened his collar, and patted him gently on the cheek before hopping off him and heading for the elevator. Acknowledged, on our way up, Felix said. Then, we weren't playing hide-and-seek. We were conducting tactical training exercises to keep ourselves sharp. That's really something you should be organizing as security officer. My job is to keep you from getting killed and to prevent this moderately valuable ship from getting blown up, Calred said, not to keep you entertained. I won, Tib said as Felix fell into step beside her, though she had to take two steps for every one of his. Current score is 705 to me, 112 to you. It's 113 to me, Tib, Felix said. You always leave out that time when I was 14 and I tracked you through the ventilation system to the station administrator's secret wine store. That doesn't count and it will never count. I wasn't trying to hide from you. So the fact that you found me is not a win. It's just you being nosy. You were going there in secret, hoping to sell the wine for yourself, so you were hiding from everyone, and by extension, therefore, you were hiding from me. They continued the old argument, which was less a real disagreement after all these years and more a pleasant exercise in call and response as they took the lift up to the command deck. Not that it was much of a command, Felix thought. He was in charge of himself, Tib Pelta, Calred, and a bunch of drones. The drones obeyed instantly without arguing, which was nice, but they were otherwise terrible company. It was hard to radiate the effortless aura of mastery Felix wanted to project when you're crew consisted of your best friend since childhood and an unflappably competent and unimpressed Hakan soldier. The ship was nice enough, if nothing special. The Timerarius was a Freebooter-class cruiser, a lightly armed ship built for speed, meant to strike fast and disappear, the sort of vessel that played a crucial, crucial support role in the Mintak Coalition's military fleet and made up the bulk of its unofficial raider forces. Of course, in this remote posting, there was little need for speed or armaments, light or otherwise. The Timerarius was stationed here to defend and lend material support to the three coalition colony worlds, two planets and one moon orbiting a gas giant, in this system. Felix and Tib had grown up on a shipyard space station near the core of the coalition, and being way out here on the fringes was teeth-grindingly dull. This posting was both a punishment and a promotion. Felix had been first officer on a ship in the Raider fleet and had acted with great daring and courage in a raid, winning glory and also riches for the coalition. But he also ignored orders from his commanding officer in order to commit said daring act. The fleet commander had been impressed and pleased with the results, but Felix's captain had been understandably furious about his methods. After some consultation, a compromise was reached. In recognition for his service, Felix would be promoted to captain of his own ship, and as punishment for his insubordination, he would be assigned to the backwater Lycian system, home to a scant million inhabitants scattered over three worlds, who produced a scant quantity of resources that nobody back home much wanted anyway. The unstated but clear message for Felix was, show that you can obey orders by being a good boy out on the edge of everything for a few years, and you'll be welcome back to do something that matters. The arrangement had seemed reasonable to Felix at first, but after eight months of making a slow and pointless circuit of three colony worlds, he was bored. The colonies were small, scattered, and rural, and none of them had much of a nightlife, so even R&R &R was in short supply, though there was a cute medic with great legs on one of the planets and an enjoyably burly gas extraction engineer on the moon, so Felix wasn't entirely without entertainment, even discounting the running game of hide-and-seek, no, damn it, technical tactical exercises with Tib. Mostly, Felix fantasized about something happening, some occasion he could rise to, some world-shaking challenge he could overcome or disaster he could avert, thus shortening his penance and returning to the fast track. He wanted to sit at the table of captains one day and help guide his polity to ever more greatness. The beautiful thing about the coalition, this pan-species nation founded by prisoners of the old Lazax Empire's most brutal penal colony, was that anyone could rise to the greatest heights, no matter how humble their origins, if they demonstrated the wit, the speed, the daring, the ingenuity, all qualities that Felix, unburdened by false modesty, knew himself to possess in ample supply. There were no opportunities to demonstrate those qualities, though, because nothing ever happened out here. Sometimes there was a storm or a flood, and in those cases, Felix delivered food and blankets. 
He was also responsible for picking up and delivering cargo from the colony worlds to supply ships and bringing back medical supplies and trade goods. Not exactly the intended use for a fast warship, but the Coalition had lots of cruisers, and this one had plenty of empty room for crates. Felix and Tibbs stepped from the lift onto the bridge, a semicircular room dominated by a large view screen that currently showed nothing but the empty starfield before them, the brighter glow of Alipé standing out in the lower left. Alipé was the next planet on their circuit, a world rich in timber, ore, mildew, mutton, and bristly predators called wolferines, who were still delighted by the sheep and goats the colonies had introduced to the ecosystem decades earlier. Tib went to the comms and navigation station, not that there was much navigating to do since they more or less just went in circles. Felix dropped into his command chair, best seat in the house, even if the house wasn't all he would wish. What's the problem? Did a sheep wander off? Are we urgently needed to help with the barn raising? Cowred, an immense Hakan with braids in his mane, shook his leonine head. He stood at the tactical board, which was even less use here than the navigation controls. Something stranger than that and my requests for clarification have gone unanswered. Show me. The message is audio only. Calred manipulated the board and a crackling voice boomed out from the blank view screen. Unknown, Psh. landed outside settlement, Psh. jammed, Psh. boosting as best we can, Psh. immediate assistance, Psh. armed. The message ended abruptly. Where is it from, Felix said. There were scores of communi communities on Alipay from small timber camps and mining towns to the relatively booming trading city in Seoul spaceport, Solomi, home to a whole 50,000 souls and that cute medic Felix liked to visit. A small farming settlement on the northern continent, Calred said, doesn't even have a name on the surveys, though I gather the locals call it Cobbler's Knob. Do they really? So I'm told, Calred said. The message came from their emergency distress system, which is probably the only communications apparatus within 100 kilometers powerful enough to get a message this far. Could this be it, Felix thought? Could something finally be happening? Spoiler alert, something is finally happening. And if you want to know what's happening and what they do about it and all the terrible things that happen to them, you should buy the book and give it a read. This has been Tim Pratt sitting in my palatial home office reading to you from my new book, Fractured Void, which is out any minute now, really, early November. Bye-bye.